here's the sort of lens they would have used. I'm going to open this up, take the lens cap off both sides, and inside of here, you see a hole, and there are, you can make the hole really, really small. That is F45, or the hole gets bigger and bigger. And as the hole gets smaller, the picture becomes sharper. I'm going to tell you a quick story about aperture. When I was a little kid, I lived on in another state, and I was a member of, we would go target shooting. And it was okay. We weren't, you know. And at the time, I didn't realize, but my eyes were starting to go. I was in sixth grade, and, and when, I, when I looked at the, I sat in the back of the classroom of sixth grade, and I had difficulty reading the blackboard. But when I went to the target range, I looked through something called a peephole. The target rifles we used had a little plate with a finely drilled hole, and I looked through it. I looked down the range at the targets, and they were out of focus. I looked through this tiny hole, and they would become sharp. And I, you know, I was 11. What did I know about physics? So I would you know, look through a tiny hole, and things would become sharper. So in the back of my classroom, I would look through a tiny, well, my fingers like this, and the, I could read the blackboard and I'd, make, I'd write down what I had to. I was an industrious kid. I took a piece of paper and punched two holes the width of my eyes, held it right to my face and read the blackboard. That'll tell you how old I was. Boards actually were black. And the, my teacher said, Charlie, what are you doing? And I said, it helps me read the board. You think of all those cr crazy things little kids say that makes no sense at all. Maybe they're wrong or something. Well, this was a long time ago. And seeing the eye doctor was an appointment weeks down the road. And once that appointment was made, the grinding of lenses for my first pair of glasses were also you know, a couple of weeks in the making. So I was moved to the front of the classroom. But the business of photographing through a smaller and smaller hole will sharpen your picture. The uh, straight photographers, would look through, and I'm going to show you a PowerPoint shortly that will help uh, identify this. The straight photographers would look through a really tiny hole to, because they want every single thing in the picture to be sharp, forward, backwards, from your toes, all the way to the mountains. The next thing on your list is the zone system. Ansel Adams was one of the founders of the group 64. And he taught at Art Center in California, not the Art Center in Pasadena of today where I went to school, but Art Center used to be on Third Street and Sixth Street and he taught there. And he thought of a system to make the most perfect possible negatives and prints you could think. Print paper has a range of from the blackest black to the whitest white. Without any exposure, the white of the paper is the whitest white and the blackest black is called D-Max or the true or true full black. And you may take a picture that has more range in terms of from white to black on a really a bright sunny day. And if you underdevelop it, you can squeeze it down till it fits right onto the exact white and black of the paper. Or you may photograph on a overcast flat day where the whitest whites are really a, a light gray and the blackest blacks are really a dark gray. And by overdeveloping, you can expand that contrast until the range of that negative fits neatly onto that print paper, landing exactly on the true white and the true black. And that was the zone system. The zone system required the ability to look at various scenes in your picture. I have to have a light reader for this. Right here. This is called a spot meter. And the spot meter permits you to look at a scene, push a little trigger here. And the key is you look at the darkest shadow where you want to hold detail. Let's talk about detail for a second. Um, look around you. What is the whitest white in your room? Is it your shirt? Is it a piece of paper? Probably not, because that's white with detail. You could crumple that piece of paper and you'd be able to see the folds. So that's white with detail. That is not the whitest white. Actually, the light bulbs above you are probably the whitest white. What is the blackest black around you? For those of you who like wearing black sweatshirts, can you see the stitching? If you can see black with detail, that is not the blackest black. The blackest black is actually the pupil of your eyes. There's no detail in there. 
So that is part of, of the concept of the zone system. You look at the blackest black, the deepest detail where you want to hold detail, and you point there, you, you meter it, and you set this dial to meet this. You land that number right on uh, zone three here. And that tells you up here the scale of the picture you're going to take. So this is an alignment of shutter speeds and apertures appropriate. And you also set the uh, film speed that you're working with over here. So you may take your picture and then you look at the whitest white where you want to hold detail and you take another, then you meter that and you take that and that helps you determine how you will develop your film, whether you will overdevelop or underdevelop or just develop it normally. So that is a, and I'm not going to ask you any of this on any test. Just know the phrase zone system that Ansel Adams came up with. It. So group 64 in 1932, no, I think it was November or December 15th, 1932, a group of photographers, the list you have here, decided to form their own group called group 64. And the, the 64 comes from then the smallest aperture available on lenses and the belief that you want to make the picture as sharp and as perfect as you can. Edward Weston had the expression called the thing itself, as opposed to softening your picture like a pictorialist or using soft diffusion or kicking your tripod. You wanted the sharpest picture because it wasn't about the artistry that the photographer uh, imbued into the picture or into the image. It was about the image itself. The thing itself was beautiful in its own right. And your objective as a photographer is to record it um, with fidelity, with accuracy, and with precision. Ansel Adams is on your list. Ansel Adams was uh, grew up in San Francisco, was born in San Francisco. He was a precocious kid. He was repeatedly, oops, what is this? Oh, good. Good news. He was a precocious kid. He got kicked, repeatedly kicked out of schools because he couldn't sit still. Um, so his parents, his father's business largely failed. So there, their situation became more and more financially tight. And they moved to an area close to the beach in San Francisco where Ansel Adams ran around. In the uh, San Francisco earthquake, he broke his nose very badly. And they, they told him when he's grown up, we'll, they'll reset his nose. They never did. And he always had a crooked nose from then on. He had difficulty breathing through his nose. He was kind of a mouth breather for the rest of his life. Um, but he, he played piano and he was extremely good and considered being a concert pianist. And he also got his first camera at a young age. His father, realizing how smart this kid is and how unmanageable this kid is, got him a one-year pass to the World's Fair in San Francisco and Ansel Adams went there every day and just looked at all this new crazy stuff in the World's Fair or what you then called the World Exposition. And he went there like every day for a year, learned a ton. Ansel Adams was something of a lifelong environmentalist. I mean, I shouldn't say something of, he definitely was a lifelong environmentalist. He was hired by the government to go and photograph the national parks and was instrumental in more and more of America's uh, wilderness, uh, wilderness being de declared national parks. He uh, was a master photographer and he was in Yosemite all the time. And that's when you go in Yosemite was a production because the roads were slow and the cars were simple. And he was photographing Half Dome when he realized that it wasn't gonna be a great picture. He reached into his bag of tricks and he pulled out a red filter and he photographed it and it completely darkened the sky very dramatically. The thing to know about filters is, um, I'll put it this way, there, white light is red, green, and blue in equal amounts. This filter is knocking off all the red or all the blue and the green, or almost all of it. So is it making red? No. This, there's this much red light in this room right now. This is just knocking out the rest of it. So there's a white piece of paper. And so red, green, and blue are coming off of this. This is just killing all the rest. And that's what's left. 
So he was able to really dramatically darken the sky. And this became uh, part of the hallmark of his photography was really dramatic, but technically true photographs. Um, most of his photographs were contact prints, uh, platinum and palladium prints. Platinum and palladium, I think I said this already, requires ultraviolet light. And they're also a very beautiful system for making prints, but during World War I, platinum became, first of all, extremely expensive, and then it was declared a militarily significant metal, and it became unavailable. Next on the list is Edward Weston. Weston is considered the probably one of the definite 20th century masters of photography. His work is considered quintessential uh, California and modern American photography. He photographs a variety of things. He photographed scenics and sand dunes and still lives, uh, vegetables, nudes. He traveled all over the United States. He got a Guggenheim Award, uh, which is a bunch of money to spend any way you want. And he basically put filled to the back of his car with cameras and film and drove all over the country photographing. Multiple times he traveled to uh, Mexico or New Mexico to photograph. Um, Tina Madani was his uh, muse and lover for a while, even though he was married. He set up his first studio in an area called uh, Tropico, California, which is now part of Glendale, California. And he uh, had very large cameras. They say he could set up his really large camera meter everywhere he would meter with a Weston meter. This is a Weston meter. And I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, it says Weston, we're talking about Edward Weston. I think, I don't know if it's coincidence that it's called a Weston or that if he manufactured himself, I really don't have any news on that. But he would meter the ground below him in all directions. And then he would just kind of like, you know, decide on an exposure. And it was said he could set up his behemoth camera and his behemoth tripod, focus, to have it all set and have the whole thing shot in two minutes and 20 seconds, which is really moving with one of those cameras. His, he had three sons, uh, Cole, Brett, and Neil, and they were all photographers, but Brett, uh, his second son, was also instrumental in the formation of uh, group 64. He was there when they formed this uh, group in, in 1932, the Bay Area, San Francisco. Imogen Cunningham. Imogen Cunningham is noted for plant photography and for her nude photography and photography of her children. She was out of uh, the Oregon, Seattle area. She came down and studied photography but she was kind of self-taught in that a chemistry professor helped her with, uh, with all the photography. And she ultimately graduated with a degree in chemistry. And she was part of the group 64 crew. Willard Van Dyke was part of the group. He was also something of a filmmaker and teacher. He left photography because he didn't want to compete with his best friend, Edward Weston he felt it was just too much competition. So he stepped out of photography and went on to become a filmmaker. John Paul Edwards, no relation, started out as a pictorialist. They all these guys started out as pictorialist photographers. They got started in the early 1900s and you know, Group 64 came into an existence in the early 1930s, but the thinking of very sharp, precise photography was already in progress by the 1920s. So I'll show you some samples of his work that you'll say, well, that's pretty pictorialist to me. Henry Swift. I forgot what I was gonna say on Henry Swift. Alma Lavinson was a uh, German of German origin and she, had somebody working on her property who was a black man, who was a man, a man of many gifts and trades. And she talked to him extensively and she began to realize the 
the challenges of racism. And she grew up really fast on the risks of racism and the concerns. And so she did a lot, a lot of her photography turned on the question of racism. Sonia knows Koviak. Um, was born in Germany. Her father was a landscape architect. It gave her a real taste of the importance of the land and that became a guiding light in her photography. She moved to, her family moved to Los Angeles in 1950. In 1919, she moved to San Francisco. She met Edward Wesson at a party in, Cal, in Los Angeles. They, they were attracted to each other immediately. He was significantly older than her. And quickly that he became, she became his assistant. He taught her photography. Interestingly enough, he gave her a camera, but wouldn't give her film. So for six months, she's working the camera without not taking any pictures. She had to learn aperture, shutter speed, lighting. And then he gave her her first film. Here's a weird guy. Um, they married around 1932. And she was instrumental in the formation of Group 64. Their marriage kind of blew up in five years. And after that, Group 64 largely disintegrated. The people were going their own ways. And she went her own ways. Own way. Preston Holder was a pretty much a graphic designer behind the camera. Uh, Consuelo Kanaga was from Chicago. In 1911, her family moved to Marin. Um, Kanaga is a Swiss name, sounds Japanese, but it's actually a Swiss name. And she pronounced it Consuelo, she spelled it Consuelo, even though the correct way would be Consuelo. She was a photojournalist for the San Francisco Chronicle. She met Dorothea Lang, who liked her. Dorothea Lang said, I've never met a woman photojournalist before. She was invited to show her work with Group 64, and she showed four prints. One more comment really fast on Sonia Noskoviak. She was started out as a pictorialist, they all did. And she really wanted to stick to it. But um, Weston really pushed her to shoot sharper. And later he arrogantly said, I talked to her and finally she saw her, she saw the light and changed her ways. Now, I wanna show you a couple of things here before I get into my PowerPoint. This is a, my location bag, my location camera, which is a lot of what they would have done. And so this is what my stuff looks like. This is a dark cloth that I use. These are film holders for shooting a location. This is a uh, Luna Pro light meter that I take with me. This is a magnifier that I use to look through the ground glass. This is my wide angle lens. And this lens, I first said it was my normal lens. And this other spot over here is where my light, my spot meter lives. And this is my four by five, which I'm going to get this bag out of the way and show you how it goes together. If I can get the camera to point this far down, maybe I can. Stay. Now, the key to this is to push a little button and the front opens up. And 
and then it open it pops up this way and i can lock these things in position this comes out and then into here i can pop my lenses So this is my wide angle lens. I take the lens cap off the back. I take the lens cap off the front. And I'm gonna show you something really fast here about this lens. This lens is shut and there's a little switch here that opens it up. And then I can control the aperture here. But when I first take a picture, when I first focus, I have the aperture wide open and I focus it and I focus my picture. Then I need to lock it shut. Set the aperture, cock the shutter. And when I'm ready to take a picture, it will take a picture. Now let's pop this into here. Lens drops in from the top. And we'll do that to me with everybody looking. Here is a portable four by five camera. So I'm going to get this out of the way. And as you can see, it has a ground glass on the back. So when I look through it, I have to drape a dark rock over my head. Otherwise, I can't see anything. And I'll also take a magnifying glass to here to make sure my picture is as sharp as I can make it. So I'm going to put this out of the way. We're going to look at our PowerPoint. Yeah, you get to look at my mug some more. I'm going to share a screen. Sorry, I have to get that thing out of the way. Let's escape this for a second and try again. So I'm going to take this up to here. I'm going to hit share screen and I'm going to launch that and go over to here. Boom. Okay, so straight photography. November 15th, 1932, at the M.H. de Young Memorial Museum, Group 64 was born. Ansel Adams, Edward Wesson, Imogen Cunningham, Brett Wesson, Willard Van Dyke, John Paul Edwards, Henry Swift, Alma Lavinson, Sonia Laskoviak, Consuelo Kanaga, and Preston Holder founded it. So here's what I mean by aperture close-up. This is a photograph of a lens, and you can see there's a series of overlapping blades inside of a lens of a camera. I'll say again, I'm not gonna ask you to know all this for any upcoming test. I just want you to sort of be enriched by this question. They can be quite large and they fold up and become rather small. 
they can now without jamming and that's always been a mystery to me how that's possible but they don't jam together so here is a series from 2.8 wide open all the way down to f22 which most of your 35 millimeter cameras will go to f22 but as you see on the far right of this scene is f64 and by convention that's how they're denoted f slash number the numbers are somewhat counterintuitive to the size. You know, somehow 64 is a small number and 1.4 is the biggest hole. Now, here's how depth of field works. Focal distance from the camera to the head of that, I'm only just going to say California bear, maybe, is the focal distance. And in front of that focal distance, the picture's out of focus and beyond it's out of focus. That's when your aperture is fully open. You have a big window. But as you stop down, the focus builds. So you hit, without refocusing from the focal point, which is the head of this animal, the background pulls into focus and the focal and in front of this animal, it becomes into focus. So that is your new um, focal point and you, ha you, you have a more, a, a broader depth of field, we would say. Ansel Adams, the zone system. That's Ansel Adams holding a Western meter, just like I was showing you guys. I love that. And that's a little four by five, not dissimilar to the one I was holding up to you. He would photograph all over the West. And he would have taken his light meter and looked at, at, the, at the trees on the far side of that lake. And that's the beauty of a spot meter. You can actually look at a distance and start assessing the light in different places, as opposed to being on the other side of the lake and holding up your little light meter. So here we are in Yosemite, one of his master photographs. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you. This does not do justice to an actual Ansel Adams original print in person. Even the posters, though cool, are not as good as a print in person. If you have a chance to see one in person, please do. Until several years ago, I was teaching at another school and they had a collection of Ansel Adams prints they bought in 1968 for $125. And I would sneak those out and bring them to Mount Sac and show them to my history class. And now I can't do it anymore. I can't even get into that school. I don't work there. But uh, there's nothing compares to seeing an Ansel Adam print in person. And here we are also Yosemite. I think the one on the left is the one the guy climbed, free climb. If you, have, if you have a chance to be really nauseous during a movie and nervous, watch free climb. Now, look at these two prints. The one on the left is without a red filter. The one on the right, he darkened the sky with a red filter. And in doing so, he also held a detail in the, in the rock face. But this is the one where he suddenly said, what if I used a red filter and darkened the sky and brought a lot more drama out of his photograph? A red filter, okay, there's that red filter again. And it darkened, it basically locked out, it knocked out all the red, all the blue and green light from the sky. Remember, it's a blue sky, but it basically eliminated all the blue, just a red filter. But the white of the snow held. Now, this is the kind of light meter I was talking about. This, I have one just, I, mine's basically just like this. And on that meter, you see a trigger and you look through it. On the orange section is where you set the speed. And when you look through it, you'll see a scale of num and pull the trigger, you'll see a scale of numbers which match the ones on the bottom. You turn the dial there, and wherever it lands, you turn it to um, three to compute your exposure. The whole tops, the whole top scale is shutter speeds and aperture, which are lined up, and you can just pick the one you want. Sorry about the quality of this image. I pulled it off the internet. She was just photographed my own. So here's the zone system. And I did Ansel Adams' zone system is a series of a scale that runs from white, white, all the way down to a black that's fully black. And I don't think this is showing the full scale. 
but by, by metering carefully and exposing it carefully and developing it carefully, you can manipulate your negative to land beautifully right on top of a print. So on the far right, you see full white. And on the far left, you see full black with no detail. The next black is black with detail. And just off of white on the zone nine is white with detail. Zone 10 is white without detail. Zone zero is black without detail. Zone one is black with detail. Now, this is how he would perceive this area and match the zones to cold detail where he wanted it to. I'm not going to ask you any of this stuff again. I just want you to appreciate that there is a rather complex technical system for making the best possible print. Now look at the clouds in the far background. Zone nine, that's white with detail. Zone five, the water in the middle would be the actual middle of the print. Let's go. Okay. Zone five is the middle. Zone three is darker. Zone two, zone two would be dark with detail. And that's okay. Zone eight is very light. So he would photograph the sand dunes of California and he could take his meter and just come up with the best imaginable print. I'll tell you, when I look at these sand dunes, I imagine my tripod sinking into the sand and just sinking and not being able to get to go stable. And I'm not sure what you do to match that. When you get this kind of look, there's a few minutes at the end of the day or the beginning of the day when you have, when you can pick up the shadows on the edge of the sand dunes, does not last long, plan ahead, be quick. This is a uh, bristle cone, this is the Eastern Sierras. And I've been there. A bunch of my friends, we all went up there looking for this rock. It's a big boulder field. We never found that rock. We wanted to find that rock. We photograph from there. You know, we've been where Ansel Addison had once been, but it was like, it's just like a huge boulder field. To the left, you can't see it from here, is Manzanar, the uh, Japanese internment camp of World War II. And so he would photograph some of the people in the internment camp. I think this, she is a nurse. I gather that from her hat and her collar and uniform and the emblem on her collar. And another person in the internment camp. And these are also the Sierra Nevadas. Um, I should have gotten a better quality. This is very pixelated. Again, I apologize. And this would be, I think, Antelope Canyon, Utah or Arizona. He also did some work in color. Now let's talk about this one for a second. This is Moonrise over Hernandez, I think it's New Mexico. And the one on the left is kind of how he first printed it back in the 40s when he took the picture. And over the years, the sky got darker and darker and darker and he would basically you know, print it darker, but dodge the clouds and dodge the moon to keep it bright. And you can even see like the gray stones getting brighter and brighter. So he did manipulate his photographs in, in his printing, which was masterful printing. But, you know, it wasn't the soft focus that we think of for pictorialism. And this is old Ansel Adams with a Hasselblad, I think, and that's behind him is Imogen Cunningham. Imogen Cunningham. Now, most of her work were, was plants. Now, I'll, re I'll repeat, she put herself through college photographing plants for the botany department. And she learned photography from a guy in the chemistry department where she was studying chemistry. And he helped her understand how chemistry develops film. But she got paid by the botany department to photograph plants and it became a lifelong passion. I swear, everybody photographs calla lilies, but she set the stage for it. Cactus. Okay. 
and she photographed her, her children with model nude for her. She also photographed female nudes. Her children again. Her children. And one of her models. Imogene Cunningham lived to a ripe old age, well into her 90s. And when they, after she passed away, they wanted to catalog everything in her studio, in her dark room. And they found these bricks, not bricks, but these heavy things wrapped in brown paper that she would use to flatten prints. And somebody goes, what's inside of this? It makes them so heavy. They opened it up and they wrote glass negatives she deemed unimportant. So they printed those as well. They found a lot of glass negatives that she had simply abandoned. Um, this is her photograph of Weston, her photograph of Frida Kahlo, and this is her photograph of, of um, Stieglitz. This is a actor, a Oscar something, but he was, he played Charlie Chan. Charlie Chan was a series of, of mystery movies with a police investigator who's Chinese named Charlie Chan and his two Chinese sons, son number one, son number two. And at that time, you'd think they could find a Chinese actor to play it, but he actually played a Chinese police investigator. He also played a, uh, he was a very diverse actor. He played Mexican-Americans. She would also photograph dancers. I have photographed dancers and it takes several tries to get it, you know, get them all airborne together. And that's Imogene Cunningham. As I said, she lived to a very old age. Edward Weston. So this is a Weston, considered one of the greatest photographers of the 20th century. This is Pepper number 30. That's what he called it. And I've seen this seashell, an original printed by him for sale for 10 thousand dollars and i'm not going to lie to you it's a beautiful photograph in person but no i didn't buy it so his lover sonia noskoviak would inspire him with a lot of these photographs to where really her name should have been on them as well But you know, he's the guy who came up with the expression, the thing itself, to be true to the thing being photographed. A seashell, a cabbage, I presume, that's beautiful. The dunes of the West. A lot of these are Point Lobos, the beach. There's like sand dunes there, as well as a Death Valley. This might be Death Valley. And as I said, there's a narrow window of time when you get those little cast shadows showing the contour of the sand. You got to be ready, you got to be quick. And he photographed nudes in the sand as well. This was one of his muses. Her name was Charisse. He would also do photographs in which he would wildly overdevelop his film, creating really deep shadows. So that when he printed, he'd have really deep shadows, building the contrast from the highlight to the shadow area. And this is Diego Rivera, a muralist. And he had been, it was a compatriot of Frida Kahlo. A pelican at the beach, probably Point Lobos. And another picture of Edward Weston. 
Brett West in his sonnet, his second sonnet. I think Imogene Cunningham took this picture. They all knew each other. Broken glass. Peeled, oh, this is like a mud flat where all the mud, the upper layer peeled up. You gotta see the original sometime. If you have a chance to see the originals, go for it. It's well worth your time. He found a pool and he, with, a, with a room that was right next to the window, he could go down inside the room and photograph uh, in, you know, subject matter in the pool. And he hired, got himself a new to move around the pool. And I believe the pool was black on the back wall. That's my understanding anyway. And here he is conferring with his model. And I'll tell you, I have photographed in a pool of water and you have to have, you have to be really clear with your model what's going on because once they're underwater, they can't hear anything you're saying. You have to think ahead on this. And that's Brett Weston. Willard Van Dyke. This is Van Dyke. And uh, a bone. Mushroom. Everybody photographed sand dunes. And then he became a filmmaker because he didn't, he was uncomfortable from being in competition with uh, Weston. He was also, he also taught film. And so if you look him up, you're going to find him turn about under IDBM because he had made a lot of shorts and documentaries. Paul, John Paul Edwards. Like I said, this is John Paul Edwards himself. And you'll see from his photo photography, um, he really started out in pictorialism, and I had a lot of difficulty finding pictures by him that would reflect him as a uh, member of the F64, Group 64 Club. They're very pictorial, his pictures. And this would be, a, it looks like Griffith, a Griffith Observatory to me. Henry Swift. Henry Swift is an interesting guy. He was very successful, very well off. He was a stockbroker and made a lot of money. He was a stockbroker all his life. And he got attracted to photography. He met Weston. So he would play with photography as well, but he was always playing with photography. And but money was never a challenge for him because he had all the money. Oh, and an interesting thing I want to say about Swift is he was so well off that when they had their show, when, they, when the whole group showed their work at the gallery to launch F64, he basically bought uh, most of the prints there. He had the money to buy most of the prints there. I think he bought everything Imogene Hunting Cunningham had up. And he would continue to buy prints from the other photographers. And then after his death, his wife donated the vast collection of Group 64 photographs he had collected to a, the San Francisco Art Museum. Alma Levinson, Levinson. She was of German descent. And she photographs heavily the... Uh, Ghost Towns of California, after the gold rush. She traveled with Weston to Taos and photographed the ovens of the Taos Pueblo. She had a degree in psychology from Berkeley. Sonia Noskoviak. Now, I made a mistake earlier. She is the one who had uh, a black man working on her property and she became rather enlightened by, by her conversations with him over Preston Holder. This is Preston Holder. I have almost nothing on him. Very graphic. Consuelo Canaga. 
This is Consuelo Canaga. Canaga is a Swiss name. And she, she never admitted to being a member of Group 64. She said, I've never belonged to anything and I never will. But she was the one who photographed the black community at length. Look at this, little white hand and a black hand. And that's Consuela Canagra. Let me put this all the way. Stop screen share. So what I want you to walk away with, I want you to walk away with these names, especially the first four, Adams, Edward, Brett West, and Imogen Cunningham. And I want you to know no, uh, Sonia Noskoviak because she was instrumental and central to the formation of Group 64. I want you to know that Aperture is the hole in the lens and that Ansel Adams created the zone system, a mastery of printing and, and, and control of negative and exposure. A lot of the names below, I'm not gonna worry about Alma Lavinson, Henry Swift, and John Paul Edwards did almost nothing of importance. Can't believe that. But no Cunningham, Brett Weston, Edward Weston, Ansel Adams. And thank you for dropping in and watching this. I hope it was, I hope it was enjoyable to you. And that's all for now. Take care. Be safe, all of you.